Welcome to The Report Card with Nat Malkus. On this podcast, we evaluate research, policy, and practice efforts to improve the lives of families, schools, and students. And on this podcast, when we say students, we mean all students, including the formerly and currently incarcerated. After all, education and criminal justice systems are connected. The traditional education system has failed many of the people who are currently in prisons, more than 60% of which are functionally illiterate lacking basic skills to enter or re-enter the workforce. So today, I brought on Elizabeth English-Smith, who's a policy analyst at the Council of State Governments Justice Center, and Gerard Robinson, executive director of the Center for Advancing Opportunity, both of which are former AEI alums who worked with me in years past. I brought them on to talk about their new book, Education for Liberation, The Politics of Promise and Reform Inside and Beyond America's Prisons. Gerard and Elizabeth, thanks for coming on. It's good to be home. It's good to be back. So we knew each other working on education policy at AEI, and you wrote a book on prison reform. Can you connect the dots for me? Where did the genesis of this project come from? Well, when you're at a think tank and ideas make a lot of sense, you'd be surprised where they pop up. So as many of us know, what happened to Freddie Gray in Baltimore started a national conversation about police, about race, about crime. Well, one day I'm in the hallway with Elizabeth and our colleague, Sean Kennedy, and we were having a conversation about this. What most people may not know is Speaker Gingrich actually reached out to Congressman Elijah Cummings, who represents Baltimore, and said, listen, this is an issue all Americans, regardless of party, should care about. And we believe the same thing. And so we had conversations, and I mentioned when I was a undergraduate student here at Howard in the late 80s. I was involved in criminal justice reform, working with youth, and that throughout my career, even though I was in education, criminal justice was always there. And then Elizabeth shared her story with me. Yeah, I mean, as Gerard mentioned, it really kind of came about organically. I think actually being on the education team here gave us a really kind of nice segue into it because we thought that we could tackle this from an educational perspective looking at the numbers and the lack of opportunity for those incarcerated. It was something we'd both been interested in and worked on in the past. And, you know, frankly, we thought that more folks on the right could be talking about this and that it was something that was really important, that it would be bipartisan. And so we tried to elevate it and really got a great response and formed a community, you know, tapped into it, I guess, that already existed to just get more folks on both sides of the aisle to be talking about rehabilitation and and educational opportunities for those who are incarcerated. So what's the pitch, right? I mean, we got education for those who are incarcerated. I mean, why? Well, in your home state of Maryland, you've got roughly 20,000 people who are in state prison. They identified over 51% read below the eighth grade level. So that's already a literacy challenge. We know from other research that people are coming in with skills that aren't great in mathematics, as well as great reasoning skills. So what we think, you know, my first job out of college, I was a fifth grade school teacher, in part to address literacy early, is we said a lot of people arrive to college with a lot of academic challenges. And while they're in there, what can we do in what we call the back end? What can we do while they're incarcerated to build not only literacy skills, but to prepare them to re-enter society in better shape, but also for the workforce. And so for us, education is for liberation, liberating you emotionally, psychologically, more importantly, as a human being. And it's just about preparing you to be who you were set here to be. I mean, I think a lot of people don't really understand the fact that 95% of people who are incarcerated are actually going to return home at some point. And so it's really important, we think, to think about how those folks are returning to our communities. Are they coming back better than when they went to prison? We know prisons are brutal places. They sometimes can make, you know, individuals even, you know, more sort of in the professional criminal mindset than when they were sentenced to prison. Sure. I mean, prisons can be an education, even if folks are not getting an education in prison, right? Right. I mean, it can be a negative education, right? Exactly. Right. And so... As Gerard said, I mean, about 650,000 people come home from prison every year. Again, the majority of the prison population does return home, and I think people just don't think about that. So we really wanted to work on this. Another thing we did when we started looking at the issue was do a couple of site visits to some different programs around the country. Visited a program called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program, the Prison University Project, which is in San Quentin, Mountain California. And there are a lot of promising models that 
we think folks need to look at and really understand how can this work and how can we have both things and really make prison a productive time for folks and give them something that's a positive skill set and something that is going to allow them to work and just have a different life once they're released. Right. So let's zoom out for a second. What do we know about prison education and its impacts on reducing recidivism and improving outcomes for prisoners after they get out of prison? I mean, is it a silver bullet? I mean, it sounds good. So there are four education pillars once you arrive to prison. One is adult basic education. That really is what the title tells you. It's getting people basic literacy skills. Second is a secondary education program. This is for people who either want a GED, which a number of prisons offer. You also have then another one that's post-secondary, where people are either getting licensure, credential, certificates, some earn an associate's degree. And then the fourth would be your true baccalaureate program, whether it's a barred college, and that's talked about in the book, or whether it's men going through the Second Chance Pell program at the University of Baltimore. Now, the traditional four-year degree and associate degree, I mean, that's pretty small. Most people are primarily in adult basic education and secondary. And so for us, we want to support people across the board. And some prisons have more than others. Right. And so these tiers, to put it short, are you can read, write, and do arithmetic. That's the first layer. Second is GD, high school equivalency. And then you go to some sort of certificate or associates. And then the creme de la creme is you get your BA. Exactly. Right. Okay. So what do we know about the effects of these programs on recidivism? Now, it seems like it may be sort of hard to know just because there's probably a lot of variation across prisoners and prisons in how many accept and engage in these, how often these programs are offered in prisons. But do we have research on the effect on recidivism? And how would you sort of put guardrails around understanding it? Sure. You know, I think another thing that sort of garnered a lot of attention around this issue at the end of the Obama presidency, and we'll probably talk about Second Chance Paul later, which was something that President Obama launched as a pilot at the end of his tenure, but was a study in 2013 that was released by RAND. It was a meta-analysis that looked at an array of correctional education programs, and they really actually spanned sort of the gamut of the types of offerings Gerard just mentioned. But it found that, again, a meta-analysis, and it found that those who participated in some form of correctional education were 43% less likely to recidivate than those who did not. And it also found that there were obviously savings that the government had as a result of reduced reincarceration costs for those individuals. I think there are a lot of you know other studies that have shown positive results, mostly looking at recidivism as the main outcome variable there. There's more research all the time. I mean, a lot of programs across the country, both federally funded and supported in other ways, are you know doing evaluations all the time right now. And so that's also part of it is building a knowledge base. But I do think we have enough knowledge right now to understand that if done correctly and of quality and, you know, with fidelity, these programs definitely can make a positive impact. And Elizabeth makes a really good point about quality, because within the the social science community, there's some mixed views about this. You know, if Gerard's not returning, is it because I went through an education program or is it because, in fact, I didn't violate a parole violation? And many people who return aren't per se for new crimes or for parole violations. And so a quality push, and this is something we have in our book with Nancy Levine, and she's got what she would call a platinum standard, to do a deeper dive to say, can we zero in exactly and identify that this program is the main reason? So We've got a couple of scholars in there who bring up some really good points, but just know that even within the segment of people who support education, it's still mixed. So a key question here seems to me to be, what's the availability of these programs? So if your question is, do we have an effect on recidivism? You know, one of the questions is, well, if people who are more likely to take advantage of those opportunities are less likely to recidivate, then... Is it the education or are we just sort of selecting on a group of people who are already sort of looking for a leg up? Has there been any way to get under that and determine whether it's the education or whether it's the kind of people that gravitate toward education? We mentioned earlier that Elizabeth and I, along with you, are in education. Those are similar questions that are raised about school choice. The kids who are involved are ones who may be more highly likely to be involved in their parents. I've heard it before. You have heard it before. And so we have a chapter by Renita Seabrook. She's a professor at the University of Baltimore. She's at a program helping others to win, where she's working with hard-to-serve women who, in fact, aren't, you know, the cream of the crop. They aren't the best and the brightest students, and I put that in context. 
But she's made it a point to work with people who are the hardest to serve, and, and she's got some pretty good results there. You take a look at the state of Maryland. They passed a law in the last few years that if you arrive without a high school diploma, you have to enroll in the program to make sure you're going to get a GED. Right. So they're moving forward there. In Virginia, my home state, we're doing some similar things. Grant Dewey, who's one of our colleagues, looked at some work in his home state in Minnesota, and his works even identify that those who are hardest to serve are, in fact, the ones who are benefiting the most. Now, are all programs like that? Absolutely not. But part of what our book is doing is broadening the conversation to say, yes, yeah, some things work, but exactly why? And given the fact there's now a federal push to better understand how this stuff's going to work, it's going to be interesting. A common thing that you hear is the should question here. And so folks will say, you know, we expend resources and people have the option to go to school. That's universally available. And education in prison is for folks who have broken the law, been convicted, and now we're giving more resources to them. There seems to be a question in some people's minds of, is this a fair use of resources? Does this make sense? I wonder, do you tackle this in the book? Because it's a thorny question where, you know, people with different priors are probably going to see it different ways. Yeah, I think it is tackled in the book. And I'll let the authors, you know, speak for themselves who touch on that. But again, I think it comes back to the question of what is actually promoting public safety. And it's obviously a goal that both sides of the aisle, every American is having a safe community to live in and, and to have a community that is allowing people to have a second chance and to not fall into this cycle of incarceration that we so oftentimes see. I mean, the foreword of the book is written by Van Jones and Newt Gingrich, and the very first sentence of the whole book, the first sentence in their foreword says, few government efforts fail us more thoroughly than our prison system. And so prisons really, I mean, Part of the book also focuses on this is what is actually the purpose of prison. I think there was once a time where prisons were thought of as a way to, you know, go and, and get the penitentiary of giving penance and actually trying to correct for your wrongs and actually make kind of a new you know person out of yourself. And I think we've gone so far from that instead of actually allowing people to correct and to have a second chance and to be productive members of society. We just make it incredibly hard for that to happen. So I really think that it's a public safety issue. And if there's something we can do while folks are incarcerated to allow them to get an education, get a job and have a, a positive return to society, we, you know, we can reduce recidivism. I really think that. And, you know, the recidivism statistics are just really staggering. I mean, it's really kind of unbelievable. I mean, a really famous Department of Justice report found that within five years of release, formerly incarcerated folks, 75% are usually rearrested within five years. So I think that, again, it's about public safety and promoting that by any way we can really in, in using evidence-based practices and, and sound methods to do that. I would receive emails from people who said, I can't believe that my family took out a second mortgage in our home to send our child to college. And a murderer is going to get a free education, maybe from the same college, and the person he or she killed, daughter will never see mom again. So this is something that's tough. In fact, we address this as part of the bigger conversation in the conclusion. What we basically believe is this. When we say it's a doctrine of fairness and human dignity, I'm not overlooking the fact that some people have committed horrendous atrocities against families and people in society. That's right. real. Some people said they don't deserve a second chance. I understand that. Some of these people have had a first chance. But what I say is this, I don't make the economic argument that it's cheaper to educate them in prison and therefore they won't come out and do it again because, in fact, they may and, and do that. The bigger point for me is my decision to send my daughter to college or your decision to send your child to college isn't a sum zero gain because a prisoner's getting a college degree. What we pay in Pell Grant and what private funds, and that's what a lot of this is, is private funds going to support someone getting a degree. Maybe we could put some stipulations. Some would say that if they graduate, you know, a portion of their salary should go to the victims. We can look at a number of things. But this for us was really a conversation going back to rehabilitation in the traditional sense. You've paid your dues to society. What can we do to make you better prepared, to make you safe? But more importantly, what can enlightenment do for you as a person? Yeah. Those are tough questions, especially when you're talking to people who've been the victims. But it's just tough sliding to wrestle with those things. 
Hey, I wonder, Gerard, can you give us a little bit of, you know, just a thumbnail history? Like, when did these things start? I got to think back in England, the penal colonies didn't have a whole lot of prison education. So, you know, (laughs) what's the sort of historical context on education in prisons? When we think about the founding generation, we think about the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and we think about the idea of opportunity. Well, just think about Benjamin Franklin on one side, also later, you know, Benjamin Rush. They were having conversations in Philadelphia about a local jail where they actually had children and adults and young people all in the same place. And it was a lot of squalor. It was not a great place to be. And so they created a group to figure out how can we better improve the incarceration of people we have in this city. And while we're incarcerating them, can we do something to build up their moral character? So at the same time, we're discussing, you know, the ideas of what it means to be an American society. We're also having the same conversation. You fast forward to the 1800s, post-Civil War. And in Virginia, there's a very famous case where the dicta says that a prisoner is the slave of the state, that he or she has no rights, that they've given those things up. And from 1871 up into the 1950s, that pretty much guided what states could do as it relates to prisoners. With the move for civil rights, women's rights, the whole rights for prisoners, that began to change in the 1960s. Courts began to get involved. And so on the history part, you know, chapter one with Max Kenner provides a great history. We've got Ames, who's got a great chapter on the legal part. So this conversation about what it means to rehabilitate is so much part of American conversation. It's just that prisons happens to be one of many, but so are schools. So it's interesting because we think, well, we haven't done much funding, but I was reading the book. In the 60s, the federal funds started to flow to prison programs, right, under Title IV funds. So what's been the more recent history on, you know, federal spending on education programs? So as you mentioned, 1965, Higher Education Act passes. There's a you know provision in there that allows for incarcerated individuals to receive a Pell Grant and go to college while incarcerated. And this is the same Pell Grant that is given for low-income individuals mm-hmm. to go to universities, and that's grant money, and it's about $3,900 or so, depending on... Okay, so right. go ahead. So this era kind of saw... I think a pretty good use of that. I mean, people definitely took advantage of it. There were programs available and that was all, you know, kind of fine until 1994, the crime bill passes, which we know set a lot of things into motion in our criminal justice system as we know it today. But one of the things it did was ban that Pell Grant access to incarcerated individuals. So it was 94 when that popular, then popular, now not so popular crime bill passed, right? Yeah. I mean, people don't think of that aspect of it, but that was a huge component, really, in terms of the landscape of what was happening in prisons and educational offerings. You know, some people say it was it was almost like just like that college and prison programs just kind of dried up. They were, you know, significantly uh, dwindled after that. And so then that's kind of how it was until... President Obama was, again, like I said, kind of on his way out out the door and launched the Second Chance Pell pilot in 2016, which lifted that ban through an experimental sites initiative through the Department of Education and allowed for higher education institutions to apply to be a site. They partner with a correctional institution and You know, again, it was going to be this setup of of offering college degrees, associates, some certificates, and then the traditional four-year degree to individuals in prison. And so now there are 60-some sites. This pilot is still going. We have one of the program directors, as Gerard mentioned, Andrea Cantora, in the book. And so this is still the state of play right now, but it's definitely an interesting history. And that's something we talk about in the book, that it's kind of this mindset of what is the purpose of prison? How do folks feel about education while folks are in prison? has kind of gone back and forth right now. And I think, though, right now, there seems to be more support for it, at least how we see that in terms of legislation. In December, the First Step Act passed Congress and President Trump signed into law. And that does many things. But one of the things it does is incentivize individuals to participate in reentry programs. And part of those programs are educational programs. Right. So that's a step in that direction. But When First Step was being debated, were there folks that wanted to put Second Chance Pell across the board into that, or did that not make the bill? Well, more in terms of 
internal baseball, the answer is yes. There were people who wanted to. Some said that's going to be a sure way of losing probably a third of your Republicans. So let's just put that in the parking lot for now. So that was a poison pill on yep. first step. I mean, Elizabeth did a great job of explaining, you know, the history of it and the politics. I mean, just think, 1965, you've got the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, which also made available public funds to religious schools, private schools, Catholic schools. And you have it also going to prisoners. Now, the first president to do that is also the only president with a degree in education, which is Lyndon Johnson. And you fast forward to the 90s, big debate about, wait a minute, should we give money to inmates? That train left the station in the 60s. Yeah. The question is, are we mad at people? Or are we mad at the crime? Because Congress, while they didn't do it until 94, got rid of Pell Grants, they did knock out people who were in there for life or people who were in there for sexual crimes. They were excluded mm-hmm. long before 94. So it's been an interesting walk to this point in history. And so there's been some work, but any movement on Second Chance Pell is still probably a tough sell in today's political environment. Is that how you characterize it? Yeah, I mean— Hope springs eternal. I know, Elizabeth. (laughs) So there is a bill that has been introduced, and it would permanently lift that Pell Grant ban. So it would basically go back to, you know, the pre-crime bill era of not only just making this a, you know, experimental sites initiative or some sort of like the pilot that it is, but it would actually permanently lift that ban. In my time at AEI, toward the end of my, my time here, I was going up to some congressional offices and talking with folks about Second Chance Pell and correctional education kind of writ large. I think there's still definitely that debate about who is worthy of an education while in prison. Should we exclude certain offenses? Should it only be for nonviolent offenses? I think people on the one end are pretty open to civil society and there being innovation in this space. When it comes to giving a Pell Grant to someone who's incarcerated, I think it gets much more contentious. And I'm not sure where that debate honestly is going to go in the future. I, I want to see Second Chance Pell Sykes succeed and hopefully we'll see some positive evaluations of them in, in the future. But I'm not sure where that's going to go, just given a lot of the kind of fraught history around it. Sure. Well, we're not sure where that's going to go, but let's go there to those sites. You've been to some sites, you've visited sites, you have folks in the book writing chapters that run some of these sites. Give me a tour of of one or two, maybe Gerard, is there sort of a traditional site that you can describe for us? When you think about a bachelor degree granting program, you think of Bard College. Started in the late 1990s by a group of people. One of them is a guy named Max Kenner. It's got a chapter in the book. And he basically said, listen, I met some pretty sharp young men who are incarcerated, who for decisions made are now behind bars. Well, they've got the mental capability to do just as well as I can. And so through a number of conversations with university personnel and trustees and faculty, they decided to create what is today the Bar Prison Initiative. And Elizabeth and I have had a chance to go there. And these men are actually learning from professors who are professors at Bard College. When they take the exam, it's the exact same exam as anyone is given if he or she are, is on the, on the main campus. There's no prison cut like, well, you're really in prison, so we'll give you a cut on this. No, it's the full part. I met one young man who already has a degree in physics from Bard, and now he's working on one in mathematics. I met another young man who was part of the debate team. They were getting ready to debate Harvard when we were up there. Hold on. They were getting ready to debate Harvard's debate team? Absolutely. How about that? And it's funny because Harvard has been debating, again, mostly men who've been incarcerated going back to the days when Malcolm X was in prison not too far away from Cambridge. But they talked about the fact, yeah, we committed a crime, they owned it. And then some of them said, you know what, I was a good student, now I have a chance to go to college. Some said the opposite, I'm not a great student. But because you had university faculty who said, I'm willing to wrap my arms around the idea that someone who's incarcerated can be just as bright, I'm going to do it. And guess who's the director of education for that program? The former dean of the Harvard Graduate School of Education. She's got a great book out as well. And she says, these people are as bright, as strong, as as hungry as many students I work with. But I came to work at this program to show that it could work. And so is it perfect? No. Is it silver bullet? Absolutely not. But they've also got young women who are in the program as well. One spoke at my CAO event in August, and she talked about her experience. And so that's a program that a lot of college-based programs look to when they say, How do we get our professors to go inside of prison and teach? 
talk to us about it. So right. that's one reason we're glad and to have Bart a part of briefly, it. Briefly, the funding for that, I mean, folks incarcerated are not coming up with money to pay for this. So this is private dollars? It is private dollars. If you take a look at a lot of the programs, they're privately funded for two reasons. Number one, politics. If you're complaining about 5800 at one point or 3600 for a grant and tuition is 39000 politically, you probably don't want to be the governor or the president to say, yeah, I'm using taxpayer money. Number two, Pell Grant is probably the closest you'll get. It's just easier to get private funds, and it comes with fewer restrictions in the state. So it's privately funded. Some donors want to be open. Some say, no, nah, just put me down as anonymous. But a lot of the programs are privately funded. The one in California, when I was on the board, we funded it, you know, from our side. Bard is a traditional site, right? And they're bringing college to the prison, but not all of them are arranged thusly. I mean, some of these programs are sort of more innovative. They're ideas that we wouldn't necessarily see in a typical college. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. One of the programs Gerard and I visited now a couple years back is called the Prison Entrepreneurship Program. It's based in Texas and you know, it's an entrepreneurship training program for incarcerated men and now women. They go through the program before release. And then once they're released, there's kind of an indefinite social support system for them. But it's nine months while they're incarcerated. So it's a three month, call it like a character course, a leadership academy. And then they do six months of what they call a business plan competition. So the participants actually create a business plan for a business they could start upon release. They pitch it to volunteers who come into the prison who are, you know, executives in the Houston area or wherever they're operating. And there's a winner. And so there's kind of this setup of on-ramping them, if you will, back into society and getting them to think about, you know, how could you start a business? And oftentimes, you know, not all of them do start a business, but it's really giving them the skills and the confidence and really the social capital to kind of get a good first start. And have businesses been born out of yes, this program? absolutely. And that's one of the things I really wish there was more sort of data or we could better capture that when you're talking about recidivism as a main outcome variable. And recidivism is very important. But when you kind of get that taking the best of the best or creaming the crop or whatever argument, I wish there was a way to better capture not only having folks not recidivate, but also positively contribute to society and start a business or launch something new and innovative. And that's what these folks are able to do. And I think really more than anything, it's this, like I mentioned, indefinite support system that they have access to. There's other graduates they connect with upon release. There are executives, business executives who are willing to hire them. And so, so much of reentry is obviously around all these other factors that allow someone to be successful. Again, those things are incredibly important and all go into, I think, um, helping someone not recidivate. When you raise the question about starting businesses, me, Elizabeth, and Andrea created an AEI University of Baltimore conference to talk about criminal justice reform. And the first panel we had were men who graduated from prison entrepreneurship program. And one of the guys there, his company grossed them over a million a year. And there was someone else who mentioned the thousands a month that he makes. But some are making enough just to cover you know, their own bills. So there's a nice range. But what's so interesting is that within six months, there's a 100% employment rate. And for the people who are going to recidivate, particularly the bulk, we're going to do this on the first 18 months, jobs is, is a factor. So 100% is great. And their recidivism rate 7% last time. 7%. Seen. Yeah. Compared to in the state, I think the state of Texas is around 23 or something like that. So almost cutting it in third. And so obviously that is one of the main findings or I guess benefits of the program. But like I said, I think there's there's a lot more. And PEP is definitely a very innovative model. Like you said, it's not the traditional four-year degree or anything like that. I should have also mentioned that when they complete the program in prison, they're given a certificate in business. And so that is something of a credential that they're actually, you know, tangibly able to walk away with. If recidivism rates are three times without education, what they are for prisoners who have education, as far as the cost equation goes, we're spending money when they come back to prison. Now, I don't know how long their next stay in prison is, but it's not cheap. So when it just comes from a, not as much the should, but a dollars and cents component, an investment in education can turn out to be a much better investment if we're keeping more folks out of jail. Is that right? 
The answer is yes, and that's why we have one of our AEI colleagues, Stan Vuger, who's got a chapter on the politics or the economics of how we think about reentry and jobs. And he's got some really good statistics in there on front end, back end, and what it will look like. So yeah, it's like an old Midas commercial. You could pay me now or you could pay me later. Yeah. <laughs> and so we're trying to make sure that for those who do go in, that we're being smart. One criticism is you're soft on crime. And I said, I'm not soft on crime. I'm smart about time. And if you're going to do the time I expect it, let's be smart about how you're going to spend the time. And part of that's economic, but also part of it is social of making sure, as we've seen in some of the prisons we've gone to in Texas and Maryland, California, is also a camaraderie, mostly of men, because we didn't go to any women prisons, of men saying, now I've got another brother and another brother and another brother who are saying that education is important and now they're not the only one and not isolated. So there's also a human dynamic that comes into play because just on the outside world, being the smart kid isn't always cool. Guess what? Some of those same dynamics take place in prison as well. Well, let me ask about prisoners. That was my next question. So perfect segue, Gerard. What do prisoners make of these opportunities? I mean, are they generally clamoring for education? Is it a tough sell? Give me a sense that you've gathered in your studies and visits about what prisoners are looking for from education programs. Yeah. Anecdotally, one program I think we touched on is the Prison University Project in San Quentin. Anecdotally, the director of that program, Jody Lewin, has told us that I don't know the exact number, but there's a very long wait list for folks to be in that program. It has great outcomes. It's a rigorous education Also, there are a lot of people who want to transfer to San Quentin Prison in the first place to be able to access the Prison University Project and other programs like it or successful programs that have popped up there over the years. I think that there's huge demand, again, anecdotally from the directors we've talked to at these programs for folks to be in the program. They are very needed. I think there's overwhelmingly a lack of opportunity for this sort of thing in prisons. And so when they're successful and helping people improve their lives and not come back to prison. People see that and they want to be a part of it. I had a chance to interview Jody prior to our Education for Liberation conference that we sponsored in November of 2017. And so you can go to my scholar page at AEI and take a look at that. It's really all over. You know, I talked to some man who says, you know, I don't care. I know it's free. I know it's available. I don't want to go. Okay. And it was pretty clear. I'm just not interested. Right. One guy said, it took me a long time to admit that I was illiterate, and he was 35. But seeing other men say, look, suck it up. Here's where you are. Let's make a move. I think one of the most powerful stories I heard was a a guy probably in his late 60s now calls himself Papa, and he went to prison before he was 18, so he never finished high school. And he's a lifer, and he's in a program to pursue an associate degree. So someone's going to say, you're in here for life. What do you need a degree for? He says, well, I'm Papa now. So when my grandchildren, so obviously he had children before he went, when my grandchildren come to visit me, I can say, well, Papa is in college. If I can do it, you could do it. So for him, it was a role model factor. He's not going to get out and use that degree for anything else. But I will say in the free world, you find the same thing in the world of incarceration. You can simply make something free. But freedom isn't free, and people don't always walk toward freedom equally. And so as much as I'd like to see people take advantage of it, there are some people say, I don't care what you put in. I'm just not interested. And in the free market world, we have to let them do that too. Let's say our listeners are all in behind prison education. And there seems like the political dynamics right now have folks on the left and the right that are in support of it. If that's the case, can you lay out what are the main roadblocks you see? for increasing the availability of high-quality prison education programs? Well, one is still the Pell Grant debate, that every Pell Grant you give to a prisoner, that's a Pell Grant taken away from a law-abiding citizen. It's untrue in 2019. It was untrue in 1994, but it's a great elevator speech. So we've got to deal with that. Second is you're investing in bad behavior. If I never committed the crime, I had to pay to go to college. If I come in, I have to pay for it. We've got to work with that. Within the Republican Party, there was a long, I mean, there's a gap between do we ban the box totally or do we just ban the box from the first page? I say with the Democrats, you've got some of the similar areas. 
I even hear from college presidents who said, I like the idea, but am I sitting in the wrong incentive? And will my campuses become unsafe when these men and women leave the Pell Grant programs and now are eligible to come to my campus? It was great when they were incarcerated. Yeah. Yes, I'm all for it, but now they're going to be in class sitting next to men and women. There's state laws in place. I went to Oklahoma to visit a prison. If you are convicted of a sexual crime, you can't be within a thousand yards of a school. So even if you went through a program and let's say you earned a degree and now you want to earn a master's degree, technically the way things are in place, you can't even go to the same university where you earn something online or in person. So we've got to work through what it means like when you're inside and when you're my neighbor. Yeah. Fraught politics, certainly, and some tough issues to work through. But the book brings a lot of perspectives and it's an important topic and it's worth picking up. Again, Education for Liberation from Roman and Littlefield. Gerard and Elizabeth, thanks for coming back to AEI and coming on the report card. Thanks for having us. Thanks for listening to the report card. And special thanks to our guests, Elizabeth English-Smith and Gerard Robinson. This podcast wouldn't be possible without our excellent team of producers who include Cody Christensen, Sophia Gallo, Macy Heath, and Gage Hurley. You can search for The Report Card on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or whatever your favorite podcast player might be. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to rate and review us on iTunes or Google. If you have any comments, questions, or topic suggestions for future episodes, reach out to us at ed.podcast at AEI.org. And until the next time, this is Nat Malchus.